webinar, Five Simple Solutions to Boost Your Online Presence, it's brought to you by Main Street Hub and YP Marketing Solutions. My name is Julie Newmark. I'm the Senior Manager of Content Marketing for YP Marketing Solutions. And first of all, I just want to thank you all for taking the time out of your very busy days to join us to learn some simple ways that you can difference in your overall online presence. Um, want to let you all know, uh, we will be hosting a live Q&A just following the webinar. And if you look over to the right of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. You can feel free to submit your questions in real time throughout the course of the webinar and as, uh, as they come to you, and, and we will address them live with our experts afterwards. So speaking of our experts, uh, let's get right to introducing them. From Main Street Hub, we have Emma Vaughn, who heads up local outreach and and conducts educational workshops for small businesses, both live and YP Marketing Solutions. We have Jeff Beisman, Vice President of Customer Acquisitions and Retention. Jeff has uh, worn a lot of hats in the local business community itself at one point. Um, and on a quick personal note, I just want to say I have had the pleasure of seeing both of them speak live, and you all are in for a treat. So today, let's talk about what we're going to cover. We are going to look at some simple steps towards boosting your business uh, online, uh, their online presence, through business profiles, customer, customer social media, mobile-friendly websites, and video content. So uh, just one final note here. If, if you do like some of the stuff that you're hearing and you want to share it, please feel free to tweet, post, share, at Main Street Hub. You can see that there at the bottom and at YP Marketing Solutions. And of course, don't forget the hashtag boost presence. So uh, without further ado, let's kick this off. I give this over to Emma. Great, yeah, thanks for the intro, Julie, and awesome to be here with Jeff today. And I will hand it off to Jeff to talk about first why smartphones have our attention, and I'll gladly give my input because I know my smartphone has my attention on an hourly basis. <laughs> thanks, Emma, uh, and, and Julie as well. Uh, and it's really a delight to be here speaking to um, this audience of, uh, of local business owners. Um, so what, what I'd like to be able to do, um, and I think Emma will, will largely do the same thing, is uh, we, we keep this conversational. Um, and I like to contrast or, or tell the story from both sides, which is what's happening with the consumer today and where is the local business? Where, is their, um, where are they sort of relative to consumer behavior? And then what are the practical things that you can do to, to close the gaps that we'll sort of talk about uh, that um, most small businesses have today? So you're really not alone if you um, sit back and you're looking at the content here and you realize that uh, you may have a problem because there are, there are a lot of businesses that, that, that do and there are really practical solutions. So we keep this, um, we'll keep this very pragmatic for you. So the first thing is, um, as Emma mentioned, smartphones absolutely, as consumers, all of us really have our attention today. Um, and it has um, forever changed uh, consumer behavior. We are habitual with our phones. We check them on average 150 times a day. Uh, and what's shown on this slide here is just sort of the day in the, a day in the life of, of an average human being interacting with their, their mobile device. In fact, I would bet that of all the participants on the phone, since we started approximately four minutes ago, many of you checked your phone at least once. Uh, so that's just the thing that happens today. And we're gonna throw some interesting statistics at you later around the specifics of that consumer behavior. And again, what you can do about it as a business owner. So we'll go on to the next, um, the next point here. So the, 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 the point here is that um, 
local businesses today are losing the opportunity to reach searchers. And we're going to talk a little bit about exactly what that means. So if we get into um, if we get into the next slide, that will uh, that will like illustrate the point to a to a high degree. So there are three stats that I'm going to throw at you um, and um, I'm going to encourage you to uh, to do some checking on your own. Uh, understand your 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 presence, and we'll actually give you some tools to help do that as well. But uh, it's stunning today in the in the world that we live in, that's highly digital. Um, our, our research and our statistics show that nearly three quarters of uh, uh, businesses, this is according to um, uh, this SBA, don't have a website. And of those that do, one in two don't have what we call a mobile friendly website. Uh, and that again is of increasing importance and we'll get into uh, why that is the case a little bit later, but not having a web presence and then not having a mobile friendly uh, website are really still a big deal for a lot of local businesses. And then lastly, um, almost all of them don't have video and aren't using video. And we're gonna talk a lot about the power of video and around consumer behavior and how you can influence it through video later on in this presentation. So we'll go on to the next uh, slide. Uh, when we talk about presence, you know, we talk about things like having a website and we talk about having a mobile friendly website and that's sort of the core. The other part of, of, of a presence or, or having a, a digital business profile is your listings. Uh, so your name, your address, your phone number, and rich content, not just on your website, but across the internet, across all of the directories and the search engines and just about everywhere else that consumers are. A lot of searches begin on the search engines, but a lot of them begin in many other places. So it's in incredibly important now that you have this robust and broad digital presence and what we uh, what we mean is those business profiles that are uh, accurate across the internet. What's stunning is, uh, and many business owners don't really uh, have a good handle on, is how often uh, that information is incorrect or uh, there's content missing. And we're gonna talk about the ramifications of having inaccurate, incomplete, or, or, or non, um, you know, just not having your listings at all on the internet and how that could be impacting your business without you really even knowing it. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I just wanted to chime in there, Jeff, because I know when you put like 10, consumers in a room now and you ask them to find a good place to get a cup of coffee you know anywhere from eight to nine out of ten of those people are going to search online and the first things that come up are these these business profiles that you're speaking to and more often times than not local businesses either don't know they're there or it has incorrect information like you were saying so it's really a critical point for all local businesses to know really what they look like online. Yeah, and, and, and Emma, your, your, your point is a very good one as well, which is it, it isn't just about having your Google Plus profile um, uh, accurate. It, 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 it's really about everywhere that consumers are searching uh, across the internet. And we're finding as you have more and more um, uh, you know, places where your content be, can be found. It's sort of distributing uh, the, the the searches that we see on the internet today. So that's an excellent point, Emma. And, and further to your point, what happens when that information is not accurate um, is consumers really lose trust. Not only do they go to your competitors, but they 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 also lose trust in your brand. So seventy three percent say that they uh, they lose trust in a local business. Um, you know, um, many, many, all, about two thirds lose trust uh, if they get lost driving because you've given them inaccurate, like physical uh, address contact information. And again, a majority of them uh, find it important for a business to have a store address and a phone number in their ads. Uh, it's almost like a, a, a badge of authenticity or credibility as well as uh, a call button. So the, the, the listing information 
um, Emma, is really let's get your name, address, and phone number propagated across the entire internet accurately, and then let's make sure that you have the right kind of content uh, depending on your, your business and the consumers that it serves. So I, I don't know if uh, that certainly is what we found in our research, Emma. I don't know if, if you have anything that, um, that, that you would add to that, but that certainly seems to be a pretty ubiquitous um, yeah, absolutely. Sentence. Similar um, with all the good points you make about business profiles, we've found too that's just as important with your social media presence. So a lot of the time when we first speak to local businesses, they they think they don't have a Facebook page. Um, we saw this a lot about four years ago, or they thought they weren't on Foursquare, but in reality they were on there because their customers created a page. So that is also a business profile in our opinion. So from your Yelp to your Google to your Facebook, these listings are all what consumers are looking at and then sizing you up. So whether they're going to do business with you, trust you as a business, just like what Jeff, you were saying about the online profiles. Which I think leads us to the great point about uh, what Jeff's going to speak to next, which is the you know the search engines and business listings and the problems and solutions that we experience there. Um, I'll let you speak to that though, Jeff, and then I, I would love to chime in. Yeah, so so you know it, it, it it's a like I said it's it's a pretty ubiquitous problem um, in that about forty three percent or nearly half of businesses really have this inaccurate and incomplete uh, information. And that absolutely impacts what's called their, their search engine optimization or their page rank um, on places like uh, Google. So that, that inaccurate or um, incomplete information is considered by the search engines and how they rank your business. Uh, and that means that you can actually be losing um, Customers, they're not finding you in the search engines because you're, um, uh, you know, you're being penalized. Uh, further, uh, if you're spending money on uh, search engine marketing, and many businesses do because it's a great way to find um, prospects or customers that are ready to buy, uh, and you have inaccurate and incomplete listings that that is hurting your your SEO rank, you're probably spending more money on uh, search engine marketing than you should because something called your quality score gets hurt. So um, what's happening today, what we're sort of painting a picture of is a, a delicate ecosystem has actually been created. Uh, so if you've got a challenge in one part of your digital marketing portfolio or your strategy, it can start to impact other pieces of it. Uh, in other words, there are unintended consequences. So there's things you can do about that. Um, Emma, as an example, uh, one of the things, a uh, tool that YP has on our, our uh, website is uh, a presence scan. So you can literally put your business information into a form on the site and it will go out and scan uh, that business and return to you, the user, uh, where that business is listed on the internet and whether or not the listings are accurate or inaccurate. Um, and then there's a remedy for that. There are lots of um, platforms out there that do uh, uh, presence and listing management. Uh, they're they're do-it-yourself platforms, so you essentially uh, can input your uh, your correct business information and propagate that out to the internet and keep it accurate um, for as long as you uh, subscribe to the service. So it's a very very good way for you to stay on top of your digital presence. Uh, Emma, what do you, what do you think of, um, uh, of like how that has evolved as a, as a problem, but also the solution sets that are out there today? Uh, I think it's great for the purpose of checking um, how you look online. Um, as for like, is your information accurate, but it's something you can't just for check it and forget it. You really have to keep an eye on these profiles. Uh, pretty consistently. I know that reminds me of when Jeff, you and I were in Detroit speaking at the LSA boot camp. And I know you spoke to that and Google spoke to that. I mean, this is something that you, you just really need to be keeping an eye on your business listings because they're always evolving. 
So definitely something to consider. And I think this leads beautifully to the next chapter here, if you will, responding to customer reviews, because on these business profiles is your reputation. And that's why we're seeing 80 to 90% of consumers heading over to these profiles on Google and on your Yelp page, for example. And for some folks online, TripAdvisor is also important. And they're going there because these business profiles with the reviews involved there, they act like word of mouth. Absolutely. And that's why these sites are seeing so much traffic. Um, but here's the good thing about what is going on in Google Plus and on Yelp or any review site for that matter, is that when customers leave a review, whether it's positive, neutral, or negative, you know, you can, it's an opportunity for everyone that's listening on the line. It's an opportunity for you to talk to your customers. So what you want to do then is, is take that opportunity. And, and the example I have on the screen just, just portrays this beautifully with Leanna Kilby leaving a review about her experience buying a car. And what I love about this is that the business not only clearly read what their customer said, uh, which you should always read your reviews so you know what's going on, maybe some things you could improve upon. But what I also love is there's a conversation initiated here. And when you do respond, you know, keep a few things in mind. You definitely want to take the opportunity to, to really learn more about what you're doing. You can even ask questions when you reply. So, for example, if you are a restaurant listening in on the line right now, this is a great chance to, you know, thank that customer for leaving a review and then maybe ask, you know, what else do they want to try on your menu? Um, if you are an auto shop on the line listening right now, an idea you could have is when you reply, again, you know, thanking them, complimenting something they wrote about in their customer review, you could also ask about, you know, what work they're hoping to have done on their car next. And so it's really conversational, uh, just like this webinar is, and review sites are just a great way for reputation management and my favorite, relationship building. So another general rule of thumb before I show another visual example here is when you're responding to reviews, and I get asked about this all the time because I do a lot of live workshops. So I'm meeting business owners and they attend for free and they get a ton of education. What I love about it is, you know, they ask, should I review? And then also, how do I, like, what do I say? <laughs> and a good rule of thumb is to keep it simple. Don't sound like a robot where you're responding the same way to every customer, of course, because that's not authentic or genuine. But if a reviewer leaves you a long review, trying to match it will take up a lot of time and they're less likely to read it. So try to keep your responses to three to four sentences to convey your message and increase the chances of it being read from start to finish. And I want to show another example. So this is a great one of a positive review coming through on Google+. And here's a four-star review on Yelp. And you, know, you can obviously read this on your own. This is for a restaurant. But I want to just highlight something real quick here. You'll see that Ralph responded to this good review. A lot of the time, good reviews go unanswered because business owners are just probably patting themselves on the back. But what I love is that in this response from the business owner, it says here, you know, thrilled to have your stamp of approval, Bethany. It's not every day the fitness menu gets a shout out on Yelp. So it's great to hear you're a big fan. So the reason why I chose this particular reviews out of, I mean, I look at hundreds of reviews in a week. The reason why I point this one out is because Ralph highlights something very specific that Bethany said. And that is that fitness menu that she complimented. So we, remember to be personable and personal, like being personable with them just the same way you would with a customer offline. So for example, in your business. And then because I know everyone's thinking this is all good and great, these are good reviews. Uh, before I move forward into the next section here, I just want to point out the importance of also responding to the bad reviews. Now, a couple important things about Yelp. So Yelp 
gets a bad rep for just being a place where people complain, but actually the majority of reviews on there are actually trending towards positive. Um, but when and if you do get that review, that's one, two stars, or just says something negative, it's a complaint, um, to respond is really showing that you're listening and you're acknowledging the customer complaints. And it's crucial that you know, you're personal when responding here and not sending out the same sort of response, but really try to make that personal and, and at the same time, just remain empathetic taking a defensive tone here. And Jeff, I'd love your opinion on this because I know you see a lot of customer reviews and, and you're, when you're looking at local businesses, probably even yourself, but just from a business standpoint, you know, our thing is not taking a defensive tone, but rather coming across and just kind of getting down to the core of their concern, that customer, and apologizing. But I'm just curious, you know, I have an example of a response here from a business owner that, really answered this beautifully. It really neutralizes that one star complaint. But Jeff, I'm curious, what, do you, what are your thoughts on just customer reviews when they trend towards a negative complaint? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. You know, one point that I think um, is fairly obvious, but if you step back and you, you think about it, um, social media and review sites have become the great equalizer for the, the consumer. Everyone now has a voice, has a megaphone, uh, and, and it's just changed the dynamics of, of that interaction. Um, you know, it's no longer a, a, a secret uh, or it's no longer simply through organic word of mouth that things travel either positively or negatively. So it can be a wonderful thing if you can harness it. But, you know, what, what I... Uh, and and I, I dealt with this as a as a business owner. I had a, a social based uh, e-commerce site uh, once upon a time. And so we had a very active community and occasionally there'd be a bad review. And we, we had a policy, uh, you know, a couple of things. Emma. first of all, always respond fast. We, we were very quick at responding to uh, positive uh, and a negative. And, and we praised those that gave us positive feedback and we would acknowledge the negative we weren't defensive and we never ever ever and, and I, I can't recommend this enough we never deleted or censored um, um, comments it's a slippery slope uh, when you do that because eventually somebody sees that and makes a bigger deal out of it the the, the what we we've done and what we see work uh, consistently is to get it get get a negative uh, reviewer or somebody that's had a bad experience out of social media and off the the site and, and talking to you directly um right. and then and then making it good and what we we've seen in the past I, i've seen this a million times is they come back and they'll post i spoke to so and so in the business and they were awesome and uh and everything's great now and so you can take a negative and turn it into a real positive so that that's my philosophy emma and, and what i see to work the best yeah absolutely yeah thanks for sharing too uh, another, and this again transitions really well into the social media portion of this webinar because, you know, you can't, you're not just getting word of mouth spread about you on business profiles and review sites, but you're also getting word of mouth spread about you, good and bad, on social media. And, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of my friends, they review on Facebook. And so this is another important place to just not only be, careful about your reputation, but what I want to focus on here is more about the content that you're posting. So with that being said, again, these these presentations are built for you guys. So I'd love your feedback um, if there's more you want to hear about social media afterwards. But one thing that is always asked in my workshops when I'm traveling around the US doing these is, you know, how do I post in a way that gets people talking? You know, it's like crickets out there. And I know that it's very difficult. It's no secret. Facebook has definitely turned more pay to play, but there is still organic word of mouth out there. Um, and you can absolutely get engagement. Like the post that I shared here, I love this. I'm not a huge Mustang fan. I like the older versions better, but this mm -hmm. post from Dallas Mustang, Whip Crush Wednesday. Whip Crush Wednesday is a really good trendy play off of woman crush wednesday so wcw you'll see that online and they just did not only a cool just play off words 
but they also have um, a good visual photo here of one of their cars. Now, photos absolutely utilize them because they increase engagement on your posts. But overall, just kind of backing up a little bit about social media, when a, when a new customer walks into your business, obviously you guys are gonna take great care of them while they're there. I mean, whether you're a dentist, an auto mechanic, you own a spa or a salon, you name it, you guys take great care of your customers. Now, the customer eventually leaves. And unless you follow them home, which don't, because that would be creepy, uh, it can be hard <laughs> to, it can be hard to keep in touch with them, but thanks to social media, we have this beautiful two-way conversation that can continue, and a great brand doesn't let the customer's journey stop at their business. It continues. So with Facebook, you really need to create the opportunity for your customers to take your brand with them, and, and that's by connecting online through platforms like Facebook and Twitter. And once you connect with that happy customer on Facebook and they become you know, your fan, uh, you empower them to promote your brand. I mean, talk about the best kind of word of mouth. It's not advertising. It's your happy customer is saying great things about you, just like what we saw on the review sites a little bit ago. And with Facebook, you know, you're empowering them to promote you. And they're doing it in front of their network of friends and family and they do it by checking well checking in or clicking like or commenting so for this post here that i shared 60 people liked it i mean on average a facebook user has over 360 plus friends so you get 60 people to react to this post that's domino effect for y'all and it's major word of mouth and it's positive word of mouth for your brand and it psychologically goes into their brain as a referral. Now I could nerd out all day about psychology and social media. I did my master's thesis on it. It's fascinating. So take my word from the many research papers I have read and written, there is a psychological referral that happens when something so simple as sharing a post on Facebook occurs or someone checks in. And with just another example, because these are always conversation worthy and super fun to talk about. Another really, really effective way to get engagement from your fans to get them talking about you is true or false questions. So this is just one I read and I literally took a screenshot to share with you guys today because I thought it was brilliant. It's a bed and breakfast. They asked true or false. You've already started planning for next year's summer vacation. So. I personally, and Jeff, let me know if you feel the same way, but when I read this, I instantly wanted to respond because, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it is absolutely one of the, the, the best techniques is to, uh, to uh, you know, ask questions, but to some degree, be a little provocative um, with, with mm -hmm. your, you know, to, that's how, that's, that's an example of, that's not, high fidelity, great content, right? It didn't cost a lot to produce that, um, but it's great content. Yeah, and you wanna answer it. And you know, if you're not a bed and breakfast on the line, which a lot of you probably aren't, that's okay, just take this and think outside the box. I've seen, you know, uh, an eye doctor do a really great true or false question, and it was something educational about taking care of your eyes, so you, you visit them less, which everyone wants that. Same with like dentists, being a dentist on social media has got to be tough. But if you're sharing, you know, good, true or false trivia questions about teeth, or if you're giving me some tips on how to keep them white, then I'm definitely going to tune in, you know, because it's important to me. And that's not just because I live in Los Angeles. I think, you know, white teeth are great. So I would tune into that. I'd want to know these things. Another great post. Uh, save yourself some time on the content here and there. We know you're busy. Um, in fact, thanks for sharing a whole hour with us today. That's amazing. But save yourself a little time and share other posts that you think will get your target audience talking. So here's another one from the BNB that I took a screenshot of because I saw it after the true and false, true or false question. And the secret to happiness is traveling, it's science. So it's in their realm of content, you know, when you go to B&B, &B, you're clearly traveling, but also 
it's a cool article from the Huffington Post. So when you're reading other things that are in within your realm of business, definitely share that with your audience because they want to know that stuff. And again, it's saving you some time on coming up with a good, a good description or photo on your own. And you can share some really interesting articles. And that's one of my favorite things to see. And I get some of my best news from the businesses I follow on Facebook. Absolutely. And before I pass it over to Jeff, and I want to just talk a little bit more. I've been saying the word target audience a lot. And this is definitely my favorite, favorite, favorite conversation to have. And that's around Twitter. And I, I can probably like see your guys' faces. I can't really see you, but I can see your faces right now. It's a look of like, ugh, overwhelmed. And I get it. Twitter is definitely a platform that local businesses look me in the eyes with pain and they're like, I just don't get it or I don't understand the importance. Jeff, have you experienced this wave of Twitter that people feel overwhelmed with it? Well, local businesses in particular? Yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, how to make decisions on whether or not, it, it, one, is it, a, is it a channel that really will work for my business in terms of engaging Customers or 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 prospects and 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 two is um, again it's like a, it's another one of the megaphone platforms that that consumers have um, you know not just Facebook right but they'll they'll tweet about you they'll tweet directly to you and and so um, how do I how do I manage that servicing relationship with them um, is, yep. is really I think the other part of the conundrum yeah. That's a good point. And, you know, th there's what I'm sharing. I want to say something about Twitter real quick before I share this really awesome example of how Twitter brought in not only boosted a great online presence for Wagon Wheel, because um, that's what we're talking about, but more importantly, I'm going to show you a return on investment. Yes, an actual return on investment with social media. So just hopefully you're all are sitting down because it's very exciting. But let me say one thing about Twitter real quick, uh, just to kind of boost your excitement. Millions of people are having conversations online every single day. This isn't just Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. I promise you mm -hmm. there are local folks like myself talking. Now, again, I hear you. You're probably thinking I don't care about 99% of the things they're saying, but I'm going to change that because here's the thing. They're talking about what they're doing, their interests, and even their problems. Why do we pay money to go to you folks on the line? We pay money to go to you because you're the expert. Sure, my dad taught me how to change my oil. I grew up in the Midwest. I knew how to do all sorts of stuff to my car. I never did it. <laughs> I told him and nodded in agreement. I understood what he was told, telling me, but I go to an auto mechanic for all those needs. Uh, same thing with my hair. As a child, I tried to cut it myself. I have horrific photos from my mom, but I pay to go to a salon. And the list goes on with everything in my life. I'm no different than your consumers. Enough about me. Chances are your product or service can solve that problem and people are tweeting about it. So there's this real-time engagement, you can connect with them in the moment that they actually need you, whereas a lot of the time when businesses approach consumers, it's not in the moment they actually need that product or are looking for that service. It's just not. So what better time than to be proactive and reach out and start a conversation with one of these active users, and it's a great place to get your brand into more conversations, and you'll be able to find new customers in your own backyard, whether you're small town, or in Los Angeles like myself, and you can really start to create an online community. So without further ado, I just wanna take you through this. I'm sure you've read what Stephanie and Wagon Wheel are discussing here, but in case you haven't, basically Stephanie is just talking about getting some butternut squash or two for the season. I thought this post was fitting because it's the fall. And Wagon Wheel chimes in, just conversational, like Jeff and I here. They're looking great, first year growing butternut squash. So notice the question, can't ask enough questions to your audience. People love to talk about themselves. 
And she says, yes and no, have had trouble pollinating in the past. So excited. So Wagon Wheel goes, how exciting. What, what are you going to do with them when they're ready? Now, some of you, because I know you're skeptical, you might think the conversation stopped there. You're like, Stephanie does not have time for this. Well, fortunately, with Twitter, you can only type so much. These conversations are quick. So check this out. Sure enough, she responds. She's hoping to use them at Thanksgiving, maybe a pie. I hope Stephanie calls me because I love pie. And Wagon Wheel says, we'll cross our fingers. You know, keep us in mind. So not pushy, not aggressive, but keep us in mind if you need any garden supplies. And the next thing they write is tweet us when you stop by. We'd love to hear what you think. So that's a really important tip when you're tweeting with your local potential customers. Make sure you close that gap by asking them to promote you once they come in. Now check this out. Stephanie posted at Wagon Wheel, and here are photos to prove it. And she says herself, I made a trip over to the Wagon Wheel Farm Stand today. Lots of fall plants and goodies. How cool is that? Twitter is great for the real-time engagement. If you're not convinced, there are plenty more examples that we'd be happy to share. And there's a free assessment offer we're giving for everyone who's on the line, because we know your time is valuable. And we'll be happy to walk you through your own pages. So there's a link there that y'all can click on. And if for any reason you don't get to it, I'll be emailing it out later. Um, but super exciting stuff with Twitter. And now I will pass it back over to Jeff to talk about mobile friendly websites and their importance. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, so some really, really good stuff around um, social media. And we talked earlier about a mobile friendly website. And, um, you know, one of the one of the hopefully the the epiphanies or or or, you know, points that was made earlier, where you're like, ah, is that uh, one in two of you don't have a mobile friendly website. Um, today. And so, you know, we're going to talk about the, the implications of that uh, and what you can do to, uh, to fix it. You know, it, it, it's really interesting, though, and, and I've talked to a lot of business owners, and there, there isn't even, uh, I think, a full grasp uh, in the marketplace of what a mobile-friendly website really is. So um, it's not that complex. We're going to show you an example of one in, in, uh, in just a couple of minutes. But, you know, you can do something as simple as um, if you have an iPhone or any other kind of smartphone, um, type in the URL for your business uh, into it and, and look, at how your, um, look at how your site is rendered on that device. If you have to, if you, have to um, you know, move it around and manipulate the content or, or drag so that you can read, that probably is a good indicator that your site isn't mobile friendly. Um, so we'll get into again some of the um, uh, some of the stats. Like I said earlier, uh, one and two don't have that mobile friendly website. And and here's the other part we talked about up front is why is it important? It's important because of the consumer behavior. Um, and there's two there's two things. There's the the consumer behavior, and it's how the digital ecosystem is responding to it. So. This, the middle stat here, the middle um, circle, 88%, uh, um, this is 88% of all near me searches are, are done on a mobile device. So that literally means, I'll, I'll give you guys a, a concrete example. Uh, I happen to be on the road today. I'm, I'm not in my hometown. I'm, I'm actually in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I want to get a workout in after work. And so I typed into my iPhone um gyms near me so literally the words near me in, 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 on a mobile device a search like that um is going to find all of the in, in google and all the search engines are smart enough because your your mobile device has location services to serve up results that are within a certain radius and you'll even see those results today if you've got location services turned on to your phone and, and it will say it's 0.4 miles away it's 0.2 miles away. So um, that's what's happening. Consumers are using their mobile device. They're looking for businesses or, or some kind of solution that's right around them. They're literally typing that. And, and almost all of these near me searches are happening on a mobile device. Um, and it's increasing significantly. So Google published a stat back in March 
that said it's up 146 percent. The last time they had published a, a, a stat around near me searches, uh, they had said it was up two times. So every time we turn around and look at the data, the data says that it's just going up and up and up. Um, and, and so that's the consumer behavior. Um, the, like I said, the, the, the ecosystem or the power brokers like the Googles of the world are responding to consumer behavior. So they look at this data and then they make decisions about a business and where they rank in the search engines as a result of that. So again, I mentioned earlier, if you don't have a mobile friendly website, you're likely being penalized by Google because they're, they want to give that consumer a good experience. If Google is, uh, is um, as an example, listing businesses that don't have a mobile friendly website above those that have a mobile friendly website, eventually their traffic is going to dwindle and um, uh, perhaps that goes to a competitor of theirs. So all they're doing is facilitating the customer experience in responding to consumer behavior. So hopefully this gives you a really strong sense of why mobile is so important. It's important because of the behavior of the consumer. It's important because of how the, the industry is really responding to that. Emma, curious to know if you are hearing and seeing the same things, because I think where this is going is inevitably down this path of you're not mobile friendly. You're really, your business is really going to take a hit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing, again, how little a lot of the local businesses know about this. Um, so it's definitely one of my jobs is to get out there on the on the floor and, and travel and let people know what's up because this is important. It really is. And that's why one of the reasons I know for our customers, you know, we manage social media and their online reputation for them. And another thing we do is mobile optimized websites because it's one of those things that, you know, social media, you can teach best practices, reputation management, you teach best practices. But when it comes to being mobile friendly, unless you're tech savvy, it's something that you can't really do on your own. So it is something you need help with. And it is crucial because, you know, if you're worried about being chosen versus your competition, really what you should be worrying about before even being considered is being found and it just decreases your chances of being found when someone's searching on the go and the smartphone is not slowing down i mean we just saw the new iphone drop which i'm contemplating about getting every day um <laughs> will i do it but we are using those devices whether we're asking siri which sends us to your google page or we're doing a quick search and your business is going to just be collecting dust online if it's not in this mobile friendly world. Yeah, absolutely. So if we uh, we go to the to the next um, slide, um, you know, again, we 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 talked about this. Um, you know, people are searching on their phones for your business, it, and if they come to a, a site that isn't mobile friendly and loads slowly, they're uh, unlikely to return. And so that's 43%. So what, what's slowly? It's within you know, three to five seconds. So there's, a, there's an expectation. Uh, and there's lots of other stats that we could throw at you guys. Um, but the, the point here is there's consumers now have a super high expectation of your online presence. Right. Your your brand reputation is at stake. They won't return uh, to your site if it's not mobile friendly. Uh, in many cases, they will tell other people they won't recommend your business. Um, again, there are there is a myriad of stats. But every time I look at it, it really just says that the expectation or the bar is set pretty high now for you as a business owner around having that strong digital presence. Mm -hmm. And um We'll go on to the uh, to the next slide, um, and, and this is just a great example of, of what I had said earlier. Sixty percent of consumers will leave and never return if your site doesn't load um, uh, quickly. Uh, in other words, it's not responsive. Um, I had mentioned earlier what Google 
um, is doing um, about the the mobile first phenomenon. Um, we will certainly be able to address this in Q and A, but there was a um, a uh, they had a response to to the consumer behavior in 2015 in which they changed their their algorithm or how they rank that search traffic. And the data that we see now is that uh, about half of businesses have lost about 10% of their web traffic. Um, and then they made another update to their algorithm, which they call mobile, mobile get into, or they didn't call it that. I think the industry really did, Emma, right? But yeah. uh, favoring mobile even more. Um, and, and so, you know, like I said, it's inevitable that this, um, th this trend is happening and that the industry is really sort of reacting to it. So to put a bow on it, it just really does make it harder and harder for you as a business owner if you, if you uh, are looking to have good search rank or page rank. Um, Emma, anything you want to add? I think we're going we're gonna to start to close on, on video, but I, I think we've made some really good points. Actually, one last thing here on this slide. Thanks for, for uh, uh, advancing us. This is a great example of like, um, if you look at the left and you look at the larger screen, that's VisionWorks as, as a business. That's how their site renders on a, uh, on a big screen, right? Somebody's laptop. Now take a look at how that is literally translated into a mobile-friendly site. Um, and and what, one of the things, if you go back to the behavior of a consumer searching for a business on a mobile device, look at where the phone number is. And that's a click-to-call number. So it's the brand. It's the same icon. But above that, you basically got a call button. Uh, and then you've got right below that a little bit around around social. So it's not just about taking what you've got and scrunching it down onto a small screen. It's really thinking strategically, and this is why a partner can help, around what are the elements on a small screen, on all the small screens that are most important considering your business and how people find that business uh, and where they're at in kind of the buyer's journey on a mobile device. So having that call in the case of this business, that call button up there was, um, was purposeful uh, by design. So we're going to quickly touch on, on, on the last topic, and that is uh, video content. And we started the, the webinar presentation with a stat around how many businesses actually have uh, video content is part of their their digital marketing portfolio, and 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 it's not a lot. Um, but what's interesting again, if you look at the consumer behavior, video is very very powerful. So 65% um, of consumers visit a business website after viewing video, uh, and it's not surprising, right? It's not that dissimilar to you know old TV ads, right? It's highly engaging. It's it's sound. Uh, it's words, and uh, and obviously it's uh, it's visual, right? So you've got a, a variety of different ways that you can convey things about your business or your brand. Um, and, and again, some interesting consumer stats, Emma. 48% are more likely to buy from companies whose mobile sites or apps provide instru instructional video content. I believe uh, and it. Yet, um, yeah, 81% don't have embedded video on their site. Um, so, you know, that's a huge contrast. You've got like lots of people basically saying, if I have some kind of uh, video that demonstrates your brand, your product, your service on your site, I'm going to buy from you. And most business owners don't have it. The other thing that uh, I get this question a lot is, does the video have to be high fidelity? Emma, I'd be curious to know what your thought is around this, but mm -hmm. my experience today, and you see this, I think, a lot in social too, Emma, is more authentic video actually connects with, a, uh, with the consumer audience more so than something that is slickly produced and, and, and very, very expensive. So I think, you know, with mobile devices carrying better and better video technology hardware right. on them, um, and just consumers wanting more authentic content. I don't think video has to be expensive, do you? No, I think just having that iPhone out, whether you're using something a consumer took or you're doing it yourself uh, in your own business, some short, quick video clips that are pretty raw are great. 
and you can really have a lot of fun with it too. I mean, all types of businesses can have a ton of fun with this. And it's one of my favorite things to see on the consumer end because I feel like I'm already in the business. And that's one thing when I think about why so many people are reading reviews before they spend money with the local business and why so many people look at your social media before they spend money. They want to get a sense of what their experience is going to be like. And so to have that video, they can really get a sample. And so I wouldn't over overthink it. Just have fun with it and be sure to incorporate it in your marketing strategy. Yeah, so so a couple of, 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 of quick points and then we'll get into the QA, um, Q and A, uh, Emma and, and Julia. So uh, Julie, uh, the video is really the future of marketing. So uh, the prediction is that about three quarters of all internet traffic next year will be video. That's like stunning to me. I, I sometimes look at that stat and I'm like, wow. Um, consumers love it. As I said earlier, you know, here, here's a really interesting piece of evidence. If you've got, you're doing email marketing uh, and you put video in a subject line, you know, studies show you're going to see a pretty significant lift in, um, in your open rates on your emails. Now you got to be able to like deliver on that, right? So just putting yeah. video on the subject line and not having it is, is not a good idea, not recommending that, but, but it, it is another point to reinforce how important it is. And then, um, Having it, you know, let's say again, you're doing an email and that email has a link to video content, your click through rates are going way, way up uh, and people are less likely to unsubscribe from your, your, your newsletter. So I think a lot of this says, look, we're in the, uh, we're in the uh, attention deficit, uh, ge you know, generation. We don't have a lot of time. So I'd rather you like audibly tell me and show me through pictures rather than me have to read a lot of stuff. And so Video is really connecting. Um, very quickly, we're seeing views per day on video uh, on a, you know platforms like Facebook go from four billion to eight billion. Um, it's staggering the growth right now, um, and and the advertising dollars that are really going into it. And then the last point um, here that I wanted to make is around. Um, I'm just waiting for this slide to build, sorry folks, is around the, the various social platforms that are out there, and Emma, you can speak to that. They are progressively uh, and aggressively attacking uh, the video marketplace. Obviously, YouTube is you know, all about video content, but Facebook has Facebook Live. You're seeing people on Facebook uh, spending three times longer watching live video uh, and, you know, they're able to watch without sound sometimes, so I think that's interesting. Um, YouTube is seeing session length now at 40 minutes, which is, which is stunning. And then Facebook, you know, just bought Instagram, and Instagram recently introduced something called Instagram Moments, which are a little bit more like Vine than anything else, but they're just quick videos available for a short period of time. So almost all the social media platforms right now are really thinking video, and again, it's important not just to have you on your social media, but also on your website. It is such an instrumental tool in your success um, today. And we at YP really think it's important to, um, to, to succeeding in the, in the marketplace with a website. Emma, anything you want to add? Um, no, but I just am really curious just to hear from our attendees on if, they're, if they are using this yet and what they've seen to be successful or any questions they have, just because I feel like a lot of questions come up around the, the video content as well as adding photos. So I'm, I'm eager to, to check out those questions. Okay, good. And I forgot a little bit of the build here. It looks like I missed my Facebook Live logo. But yeah, to, uh, Emma, to your point, this sort of brings us to the uh, end of the presentation and into our uh, Q&A section. Woohoo! Awesome. So, Julie, do you want to specifically send any questions my way or Jeff's way, or how, or would you like us to just tackle some? Yeah, let Let's see if my sound is working. Hello, everybody. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm going to try to facilitate some uh, Q and A for Jeff and Emma to answer. 
Um, let's start with a question for Jeff. This comes from Amanda, and it's around updating the address of your business. So she says, after our business moved, we seem to update the address everywhere, yet customers still manage to find the old address. So that that is a problem I've definitely heard before. Jeff, do you want to take a stab at how to solve that? Yeah, it, that, that, Amanda, it's a great question, and it, this just really gets back to the to the challenge with business listings on the internet. And I'll, 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 I'll try to keep this as straightforward as possible, but there's so many places that that information sits. And, um, and there are a lot of people uh, out there in the data ecosystem that will actually pick up your information that you created somewhere and give it to somebody else. And in the process of giving it to somebody else, it gets manipulated or changed in some way. Uh, and so what we see happening because of this ecosystem and because you, you would have to go to, let's say there's 65 places across the internet where your listing information could live, your name, your address, your phone number, all that stuff. You literally have to go there and manage it all the time. Because uh, one of the stats that we, we see, uh, we, we have a partner, that's actually studied this is that the average listing information is changing once every six days. And so there's two ways you can tackle that. The first is you can be on it all the time. Uh, and some people want to do that, but they're literally making sure that that info is constantly updated and, and they're checking it, right? Just because again, somebody can manipulate it or, or change it and you don't have that control or, you can sign up for a service. Um, we, we have a, a product called YP Present Starter, and, and that will actually allow you to centrally control all of your listing data from one place and ensure that it, it's properly pro propagated. And if you want to make a change or you want to add additional content or whatever, you're kind of doing it from one place and then distributing it. So uh, I'm not saying you can't do it uh, the, the first way, I'm just saying it's generally a lot easier to do it from a, a central location or a platform. Very good question, Amanda. Answer. Um, I, saw. I just want to let everyone know we have no shortage of questions. <laughs> we do have a shortage of time, though, so I'm going to try to get in a couple more. Um, I have one that I think would be great for Emma to answer. It's from Mallory Parks, sure. and Mallory asks, is it just as important to include photos in a Twitter post as it is in a Facebook post? Yes, yeah, so there's a there's definitely some cool ways you can incorporate photos. I think that it is important to definitely mix it up when it comes to how you're posting on Facebook and Twitter. So just an overall rule of thumb, you can absolutely share the same posts that you have on Facebook to Twitter to save you some time um, because often there's a different audience on both platforms. But also when you're just doing a tweet that's different than a Facebook post, I think that it is great to really focus on the content there um, and make sure that it's short, witty, conversational, or call to action post. It's really also watching how your posts do. So not just assuming, hey, these posts I'm doing are working great, but to look at the cool insights that each platform gives you so you can really see you know, was this time of day more favorable or should I start tweeting in the evening to reach my audience? So I really can't stress enough. I, I, should, I could probably do a whole webinar on Twitter, but to include, you know, your video or content or photos, just make sure you're mixing it up and you're doing it three to five times a week. That's really like a great place to start. Um, but if you have any other questions about that, uh, I'll be sending out a free assessment offer where you can actually talk to one of our Twitter experts one-on-one -on -one for free and, and really grill them with questions about posting um, for Twitter and Facebook. But just to Emma's point to what she just said, we will be sending out a follow-up email to you all that will include some great offers. So make sure to keep an eye out for that. Uh, okay, last question from Ali Seligman. I think this can go out to Jeff and Emma. 
I have recently taken over managing our online reviews. We have some old negative reviews on Yelp, and I'm curious if it makes sense to go back to those and respond, or should I just work uh, on moving forward? Yes. Emma, so why don't you Jeff, take that one? You want yeah, me to take that one? Please. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a this is a great question. It's asked a lot, and what we found, and this is again comes from our experience of managing thousands of Yelp and Google pages for six years. Absolutely, uh, it's important to respond to even the old reviews. And if you have a ton of reviews, I would definitely just choose maybe five of the most significant ones that really are like your best opportunity to respond and start a conversation. Um, but it's never too late. It's better late than never to respond. And the reason why is because consumers will look at reviews and they have filters for how they look at them. So they might not just be looking at the most recent review. They might be looking at um, other filters that bring up uh, older reviews. They might go straight to your positive or straight to your negative. So to to really win over a potential new customer, because maybe that person who wrote the negative one will never come back, think about the 99%. And what I mean by that is when it comes to Yelp, 1% of people are writing reviews, the rest are actually just reading them. So you can really win over a new potential customer with a great polite response, uh, even to those outdated reviews. Jeff, did you want to add anything to that? I, I, I agree completely. Um, I don't think that it's it's ever too late. I think it's time well invested, and it actually demonstrates, um, you know, that that you really care, right? Even if it's mm -hmm. it, it, the review, uh, your response to the review is 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 dated, um, you know, sometime later. It's like, wow, you know what? They're they really do care about customer feedback, um, and and so I I I think you're right. Thanks, Jeff. Well, I great. Take your support. <laughs> I just want to uh, say we are a little bit over time, in fact, but thank you all so much for joining. And thank you to everybody who asked questions. We are going to do our best to address each and every one of those uh, and get back to you via email. Um, but in the meantime, we've got this last slide. If you want more information from Main Street Hub, there's the uh, website and also for YP Marketing Solutions. Um, thanks again for joining us. And thank you to Jeff and Emma for your wonderful, informative presentations. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank a good you. day. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Julie. Thank you both. All right. Bye cheers. Now. Bye.